Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and we are doing all physical effects today, no CGI at all. Now, uh, about a week ago, CN Arsenal did a video on the top 10 pistols of World War I, and I watched it, and I thought, that's an interesting take on things. I agree with some of it, and I disagree with some of it. I've got some of my own ideas about this particular question. And so I figured I'd do my own video on the top, I'm going to do the top five pistols of World War I, because I think ten is maybe a little bit excessive. Um, and there are some differences between mine and CN Arsenal's, and I'll talk about one of them in particular, but for the rest I'm not going to tell you exactly what CN Arsenal's choices were. So if you're interested in what they thought the top pistols were, I have a link in the description text. Check out their video on Top 10 Pistols of World War One. Now, for mine, we're going to start with number 5 and move our way up to number 1. And number 5 is in fact a place where I disagree with CN Arsenal. I give number 5 to the uh, Rothsteyer, or Rothkrnka, uh, model 1907 uh, cavalry pistol. This was used by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And I should say, actually, at this point, the criteria on which I am making uh, these choices are essentially locked breech fighting pistols, judged as combat pistols. So there are a lot of different ways that one could approach what's the best handgun of World War I. You know, is this from a cost perspective? Is it from a national uh, logistical perspective? Is it, you know, well, we're going the other way, which is what CN Arsenal did, which is how do the guns handle from the perspective of an individual user who has the skill to actually make use of a handgun, which is not the most common thing for an actual military handgun, especially in World War I. A lot of the guys, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of the guys who were issued pistols weren't very good with them, they didn't have much training with them, and particularly uh, powerful pistols were not going to be very effective weapons, they just were hard to actually hit targets with. But today we're looking at these from, if you are the experienced, practiced pistolier, what are going to be, in my opinion, your best choices for World War I. We're explicitly leaving out all of the basically 32 caliber and under, all the blowback pistols, largely because that's what CN Arsenal did. So back to my choice here for number 5, the 1907 Rothsteyer. Uh, I frankly love this thing. It's The cartridge is a little bit underpowered, um, it's 8mm Rothsteyer, uh, but it, it feeds from a 10 round fixed internal magazine loaded by frankly the best stripper clip I've ever run into. Now I think this pistol would be even higher on my list if it didn't use the stripper clips and had a detachable magazine instead, but there are advantages to the stripper clips. Largely you never have problems from a damaged magazine. If you can get the rounds into the gun, they're gonna feed and function properly, because you don't have feed lips to damage. This has um, a very early, uh, for its day it was very technologically advanced, striker fired system. Uh, you essentially have sort of a double action or a Glock style safe action trigger pull. Um, it's a big pistol in the hand, but I find it very comfortable. And one of the, the silver linings to having a slightly weaker cartridge is that it's extremely easy to shoot. There's very little felt recoil to it. The bore axis is a little bit high, but because the cartridge is kind of wimp on the wimpy side, it's super fast and easy to shoot. Um, the sights are good, the trigger's not bad, it's very comfortable in the hand, and to me it brings a lot to the table for an actual fighting pistol. Uh, I've taken this to a backup gun match, had a great time with it. So this is my biggest deviation, I suspect. Well this is one very major deviation from uh, between my list and CN Arsenal's, because they didn't include this anywhere in their top 10. I think that's a big oversight. Now moving on to number 4, I have the Steyrhan, another Austro-Hungarian pistol. This is the model of 1912. This one is not quite so ergonomic. It's kind of like a ruler. It's like it's a very square grip. Um, it is chambered for a more powerful cartridge. This is in 9mm Largo, 9x23, 9mm Steyr. Um, but what I like about this pistol is it's just a very functional, easy to use pistol. A lot of the World War I pistols had strange quirks to them, because a lot of them are still early development semi-automatic pistols. Like, there hadn't been a lot of time for this sort of thing to, to properly develop, especially with locked breech pistols. The Steyrhan is a little bit awkward. It's another pistol that uses a fixed internal magazine with a stripper clip feed. Um, 
it's not as good of a stripper clip feed, but it is reliable again, you don't have to worry about any, ever having damaged magazines to deal with. The controls are pretty straightforward. Um, the safety's not bad at all if you're right-handed, it's right there under the thumb. Now, I should point out, in my mind, especially in World War I, the effective way to carry a service handgun would be with the chamber empty, because all of these things, almost all of them, with the exception largely of the top guns that we're going to be looking at here today, <coughs> they all have kind of sketchy safety mechanisms, they're all being carried in flap holsters, Carrying a pistol in World War I is not something you do because you might turn the corner in your bunker and, oh my goodness, there's a squad of Germans and you have to quick draw and defend yourself. These are pistols where pretty much you know if you're going to be using them and you can draw the pistol, charge it, put a round in the chamber, and then commence with whatever you're going to do that might involve having to fire the pistol. So I'm not that concerned about the safety. To me, the most important element of the safety is, is it something that can be put on and effectively used if you fire a few rounds and then you need to rechamber or uh, reholster the pistol to go do something else. And in this case, the Steyrhan has a safety that's just great for that. It's a little thumb safety right there, locks the slide, locks the trigger, locks the hammer. Um, very nice, effective cartridge. A little clunky, but a good system, a reliable gun, a nice potent cartridge. Overall, fantastic. To me, that takes the number four position of pistols that I would want to have in my own hand if I was in World War I. Now, number three is um, <laughs> a little bit of another sort of physical effect here. I do not actually have a Webley model of 1913 self-loader in my possession to film here, so I have printed a picture of one that's a little bendy now. This is a terrifically ugly gun. It's a very rare gun. There aren't very many people that have experience shooting this, and I am fortunate that I did have the chance to do some shooting with one. And frankly, it is a vastly underrated pistol, I think because few people have a chance to actually use one, and it looks so ugly. It looks kind of brick-like, like the Steyr Hahn. Um, it is chambered for 455 Webley self-loader, which is essentially a semi-auto, semi-rimmed version of the 455 Webley revolver cartridge. It's a good cartridge, it's a big bore cartridge, moving at moderate velocity. It's slower than 45 ACP, um, but very much a, a potent, effective cartridge. There are a few quirks to this one. Uh, it does have a mechanism where you can actually lock the magazine uh, just slightly out of, of battery, essentially, and then hand load the pistol one round at a time. It's sort of the magazine, well, it's the magazine cutoff system, like the British were using on their rifles when they adopted this thing. I don't know that that really has that much practical use in the handgun world. Frankly, the fact that nobody adopted something like this ever again suggests that, yeah, it wasn't that useful of a system. But um, all in all, this is a reliable pistol. It's a remarkably soft shooting pistol. It's effective to use. Um, it's got a big old grip safety on it, which is perfect for you fire some rounds and you need to reholster the thing. Um, that grip safety is going to be an effective safety for you um, without needing a lot of attention. Just in the holster, release the grip safety and you're, you're good to go. Not quite 100% safe by today's standards, but for World War I that, that takes care of it. Uh, yeah, I think the Webley self-loader is definitely an excellent pistol, uh, an excellent fighting pistol. It's a little bit big, it's a little bit blocky. The semi-rimmed cartridge is a little weird, or it might be higher up on my list. The sights are really good, the trigger's not bad. Would not feel badly underarmed if I found myself in combat with a Webley 1913 self-loader. Now we're getting... You, you probably noticed a couple of distinctly missing guns, and we're getting to those. So number two is going to be the Luger. Um, the Luger is a fantastic fighting arm, as uh, evidenced by the fact that so many different countries would go on to adopt and use the Luger for decades after World War II, and including, of course, the German army. Now, there were multiple versions. You've got Army Lugers, you've got Navy Lugers, you've got Artillery Lugers. Uh, the Army Luger, to me, is probably the best option. The navies are... this is a 4-inch gun in 9mm Parabellum. Um, some countries adopted 9, some countries adopted 7.65. To me, they're both excellent cartridges. Um, the Army is a 4-inch version for the Germans. I think that's probably ideal for a daily carry defensive sort of pistol. Um, Artillery Luger is really more of a PDW, and I'm leaving it out of this conversation. 
Um, it does show up in CN Arsenal's list, and if you want to know where it shows up in their list, check out their video. But the Navy Luger is a little bit bigger, it's got a 6 inch barrel, it's got slightly different sighting arrangement. It's fine. I think given the choice between the two as an actual fighting gun, I'd probably take the Army Luger because it's just a little bit handier, a little bit lighter, and this handguns in the military are the sort of thing you tend to carry a lot more than you actually shoot. So um, again, we do have, well, we do have a grip safety here, um, which is nice. We also have a manual safety that works just fine. It's an eight round magazine, it's a very potent cartridge. It's a reliable gun for the most part. Um, it's an expensive gun to manufacture, but that's not a a factor that we're taking into account here today. Some people will like the angle of the grip on this, some people don't like it so much, but the trigger's good. I, It's a great gun. Uh, it should probably come as no surprise. Frankly, I think for a list like this, numbers three through whatever at the bottom are going to be the most interesting, because numbers one and two are pretty well obvious. Number one, of course, being the 1911. Now, that said, the 1911 in a World War I context to me is not a perfect fighting gun. Uh, the sights are not nearly as good as some of our other examples here, notably the Webley 1913, which has really big awesome sights. The sights on the 1911 are kind of tiny, the trigger is very nice on it. Uh, we do have a good safety, we have a grip safety once again, so if I fire a few rounds and I need to put it away, I just, I can engage the manual safety as well here on the back. Well, I could engage it if the hammer was cocked, but I don't have to. Um, once I release a grip on the pistol it is mechanically safe, thanks to the grip safety. The biggest downside to me to the 1911, and people are going to disagree with this, is in fact the cartridge. Um, the 1911 would be better off with a lower powered cartridge. I think 45 ACP in particular is pretty heavy recoiling, especially for World War I. Uh, well, frankly for most any army, without a ton of training this is a this is one of the harder guns to shoot effectively. But if you do have the training and the practice to utilize it well, <coughs> say you are for example on your military's marksmanship team and you get to actually practice with the thing a lot, this is going to be an extremely effective handgun, and the greater power of the cartridge will have a greater impact on people that you shoot with it. Which is important, you might have to shoot someone twice with that uh, Ross Steyer, you'll probably only have to shoot them once, assuming you do it well, with a 1911, and that does, like, there's something to be said for that. It is, again, it's kind of obvious that the 1911 is an excellent fighting pistol just because of how many people it has been used by and for how long. Um, this is still a pistol that I would not feel particularly underarmed going into combat with. Would I prefer something with two and a half times the magazine capacity, which is what you can get with today's modern pistols? Yeah, I definitely would. But 1911's a good gun. Um, there is a little bit of American bias probably in that, but it's it's a really good gun. I'll tell you what, I will give one honorable mention here, and that is to the lowly, much uh, underappreciated Ruby. Um, people are going to say I'm doing this only because I'm a Francophile and it's a French army pistol, and Maybe there's a little tiny element of that, but frankly the Ruby is an excellent overall national scale solution to the military sidearm, because it is super cheap, it is easy to shoot, it's 32 ACP, it's a relatively heavy gun, it's got minimal felt recoil, extremely easy to shoot. Um, you don't have nearly as many issues with things like flinching and excessive recoil causing issues with aiming and follow-up shots. It's uh, got a relatively large magazine capacity, nine rounds, uh, compared to others of its day. We've got a couple of ten rounders here, but once you get below the some of these guys, there's a lot of pistols in World War One. There are 32s that have six, seven, eight round capacity. Uh, a lot of revolvers out there with a six round capacity. I would rather have a ruby than probably any World War One revolver. And because of the cost for the French, it, well, the cost for anybody, it would have made a lot of economical sense. It's a heck of a lot cheaper to buy a lot of these than to buy some 1911s or, God help you, some Lugers uh, that are quite substantially more uh, complex to manufacture. So I honestly really like the Ruby as a combat pistol. Yeah, it's underpowered. Yeah, it's got a terrible reputation, but I think it's way better than people will generally give it credit. Now, it doesn't fall into this because we have specifically limited our scope to locked breech more powerful pistols, but uh, a, a special award here for the Ruby. Anyway, what do you think? You think I got it right? 
think I got it wrong? Uh, what do you think about my list compared to CN Arsenal's? Like I said, I've got a link to their video in the description, check it out. Um, see if you agree with them or with me, and uh, let us both know in the comments. Hopefully you enjoyed this one, thanks for watching!